Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, Ingenious Thinkers, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, curator of Say Hi to the Future, helping leaders think differently in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. Better thinking, better outcomes. With me today is Janice Kasamasari, author of Decentering Whiteness in the Workplace and founder of BWG Business Solutions. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Dr. Janice Gassimasari, welcome to say hi to the future. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. So Janice, there is a term that you use that you write about now that I, I think is really important to bring out, and it's about decentering whiteness. Now you speak about it in the workplace, but talk to me about decentering whiteness um, and what that is. Yeah, thank you so much for again the opportunity to talk about this. So one as a consultant, I work with organizations and institutions on helping them with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've noticed in the last three years that a lot of workplaces have been struggling with their DEI efforts. And I think part of the reason is because whiteness is still being centered in the workplace. And I think it's so pervasive that we don't really think about it. Our tendency to believe white people more than non-white people is one of the ways that it shows up. And I was just having this conversation mm -hmm. with someone about the people that go missing. So anytime we watch the news and we hear about someone that is missing, you know, it wasn't until like very recently that I think we hear more about non-white people. But I remember when I was growing up, a really prominent person that I kept hearing about was John Benet Ramsey. And mm -hmm. as, a, as a kid, that's all that, that was being shown on the TV. And so I think that our sort of fascination with and prioritization with white people, white ideas, anything that's central to white culture is what I call whiteness being centered. And so I think that when we start to unpack the ways that we center whiteness in our own lives, and I talk about this in my book, like how I center whiteness, it was like, a, it was definitely a realization for me to think about all the ways that I prioritize whiteness or I learned to prioritize whiteness throughout my life. And so I think it's really important that we all take time to focus on and unpack that. So what I, I find it fascinating is one of the things that, most of most you know wicked challenges especially social wicked challenges um we're always looking at the symptom if you will what's going on what's being said how people are being treated but you sort of come back up to the ladder to where does this really start and when you talk about unpacking it i think that's the most critical part mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah and it's hard. I think what, what's really interesting, Ken, what I find most interesting is how non-white people often, there is, when we talk about race and racism, it's often in the binary of like Black people and what they experience from white people. But we also have to think about me as a Black woman, what messages have I internalized that have made me believe that as a Black person, I'm lesser than and white people are better than. And I can point out in so many ways, growing up in mostly white environments, how I internalized that. And I didn't realize it even to the point of, and I wrote this in the book where as a kid, I didn't like rap music. And the reason I didn't like rap music is because when I was younger, I remember all of this hoopla and all of the, these issues around gangster rap and how there was like this huge conversation about how rap music was bad and bad for the culture and bad for people. And I saw how a lot of my white peers reacted when it came to white uh, black music and rap music in particular. So I was like, I'm instead going to listen to Red Hot Chili Peppers and No Doubt and all of these white musicians because I want to stay as far away from anything associated with Black as possible because I felt like that would help me gain acceptance and be liked more by my peers. So I was chasing after like a proximity to whiteness. And when I started writing the book is when I actually unpacked 
a lot of those things that I, a lot of the ways that I centered whiteness growing up that I never even really thought about. And so when you talk about it, I mean, your examples you're talking about from an African-American perspective, which I get, did you, did you look at sort of South Asian populations, indigenous um, Americans? Like how does this sort of, is it a catch-all for not being white, if you will? Yeah, so I actually, in the book, I talked about it from a workplace context. And I talked about how, and I tried to emphasize, because when I had the conversation, even when I told my one of my best friends I was writing this book, Decentering Whiteness in the Workplace, she said, oh, so you're writing a book for white people. And it she didn't understand that everyone, you know, centers whiteness, regardless of your background. So in the book, I really talk about ways that in the workplace, when we're making decisions, we center white people, white culture. So that could be in a meeting, right? One of my clients had this experience where uh, she was, her manager was a South Asian man. And he made a comment about her hair when she goes to see clients. And he made sure to emphasize, you know, you wanna make sure when you're visiting these clients, your hair is presentable, right? Because there's an assumption and there was that cultural barrier where he didn't see anything wrong with what he was saying, but she felt like it was a very racialized sort of statement. So I talk about how that shows up and how easy it is to look at someone's name, for example, and discriminate against them, right? There was a study that was done on Muslim sounding names, and they found that people with Muslim sounding names were discriminated against more than their counterparts. So it shows up in so many ways, but what I really, I think one of the things I want people to understand is all of us can be victims to centering whiteness. It's not just the white people thing. And so I think everyone of any background or race or ethnicity has been guilty of this, but it's important for us to unpack how it shows up in our systems. So, and then that's that's interesting. You talk about how it shows up in our systems. So we'll get more into the workplace, but everything impacts the workplace. Like as little children, we we soak up what's around us, whether it's at home or kindergarten, grade school, whatever it is that, that you know, those steps between being born and getting into the workplace. Um, news, and I mean, there's absolutely a bias in news and how different races um, or religions, uh, religions, ethnicities are, are picked up and reported on. I, so you can't do this in isolation. This is not just a workplace. It seems to me like the workplace is just reflecting everything else. Absolutely, yeah. And so um, in the book, I have a chapter where I just talk about me and my life, right? My desire to go to certain schools, was rooted in whiteness. And I think for many of us, I talk about in the book, you know, we know with Asians, there is this model minority myth where oftentimes Asians are, Asian Americans are pitted against the black community and they're sort of propped mm -hmm. up and they're made to feel and believe that because they worked hard and because they have these specific traits that regardless of whether you are a racial minority, you can make it to, or you should be able to make it to because they have, right? They're used as the example. And so I talk about how, you know, we all buy into this and we think that if we do the right things and if we are respectable enough that we will be accepted and that we won't be victims of all of the isms that, permeate society. But I think, like you said, the workplace is just the tip of the iceberg. It starts so young where, you know, it starts when we're children and we hear these things and we see these things on TV. And I remember hearing things just when I went to school and, you know, all of these different sort of situations where we're made to believe that white people are better than other people of other races, right? I remember you know, in history class, just the things that we would learn. And I never learned about any other communities outside of Europeans. It was mostly like European history in my history class. And I grew up in Virginia. And in Virginia, Virginia was, Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. So I should have been learning more about 
enslavement and indigenous people and all of these things, but I wasn't learning about that. So it starts so young. So it's a, definitely a lifelong journey because if you believed and thought in a particular way your entire life, it is so hard not to keep reverting back to old ways or old habits. Right, right. The, 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 thing, the other thing that strikes me too, um, the term whiteness in and of itself, um, I, I'm white, that's kind of obvious, but I'm, I'm part of a religious minority and um, we're not treated that well. <laughs> so the, the term whiteness to me seems to be a little bit all encompassing. Um, it, it, can it, does it break down deeper than that? Because certainly, boy, between different religions and where you're from, there's no, unfortunately, there's no shortage of hate in the world. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great question. In the first chapter of my book, I broke down when I say white or whiteness, what I'm talking about, because you're absolutely right. And our conception of one thing that was really interesting that I didn't know was that when in the U.S., when and the book speaks mostly from a U.S. context, but I feel like it could translate to other Western countries. But in the U.S., when Europeans came here, there wasn't a conception of whiteness. It wasn't like they're white, we're black, right? It was like, I am Irish. I am right. British. I am this. I am that. And then, you know, and it's funny that you, you know, mention um religious minorities because in the book I actually use there's a book called how the Jews became white and in that book uh, the author talks about this sort of amalgamation of like Jewish Americans Jewish people coming into the U.S. and not being seen as other and then over time how the our understanding of Jewish people in America and whiteness has shifted. And so in the book, I make sure to explain that in 10 years, our conception of whiteness will definitely change, right? Because it's just, you know, right now they're changing the U.S. census to where if you are uh, Middle Eastern or North African, you'll have your own category. So prior to recently, you know, if you are Middle Eastern or North African or Arab, you have to check white on the U.S. census because there isn't like a racial category for you. So I think that as time goes on, our conceptions and understanding of whiteness will continue to change. And that's what makes things so complicated is that it's like what makes a person white? There's no definition of, of mm -hmm. whiteness per se, right? It's just being having lineage from certain countries. But I think we as individuals know what a white person is when we see a white person. So it's like very difficult. And I think that's what makes this so challenging is that our understanding of race is constantly evolving and changing and shifting. And so I kind of break down like what I'm talking about when I say white, you know, in the book, but also acknowledging how this definition will probably change. Yeah, I, and I and I have to say, I mean, I, you know, my kids are 25 to 30 now, but I just look at this next generation for me, especially through social media and technology, there's an exposure to different countries, colors, uh, races, religions, at an age that I, I didn't have, and not because I didn't want to, but we didn't and have technology. I mean, so I I would hope or posit that we are going to come together. I don't know if that's just um, idle hope, but I don't know what your thoughts on that are. I mean, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I do think that these younger generations like Gen Z and I think Generation Alpha is the generation after that, after them, I think that we're more socially conscious and aware because we are having more interactions with each other. And me growing up, I didn't have social media or there wasn't social media. So I wasn't able to see what someone's experience in Kenya was or in Latvia was. Mm -hmm. But now I can just open my phone and see all of these different things. And I think that there is also an encouragement more for people to travel. And I do think traveling can be really instrumental in helping us like widen our lens. So I, I'm hopeful, maybe I'm like overly optimistic, but I do think that people are changing because we're recognizing that 
um, whiteness, going back to whiteness as a system is, it's really interesting. Whiteness as a system is harming us all, even white people. And I try to emphasize that because when I have these DEI conversations, sometimes I feel like people check out because they're like, well, I'm white. This is not relevant to me. And I'm like something like environmental racism, for example, where as a non-white person, you're more likely to live in like a place that's more polluted. Well, pollution affects all of us. So even if the pollution seems to be happening over there in that area to those people, it has trickle down effects for all of us. Right. And so I think it's really, really important for us to understand how interconnected all of these systems are and how even if it seems like it doesn't affect or impact us, we're all impacted by it. So, uh, Janice, let's bring this back to the workplace a bit. Um, look, I think that, that was great. Look, context for me is critical because, again, talking about the workplace without understanding um, what surrounds us or envelopes us. Um, for me, is pretty challenging. But going into the workplace now, what is it that you do? How do you? What have you seen? How do you support um, the next step or the step forward? Yeah. So I I've seen you know there was in 2020. So I started my consultancy in 2018, and I I saw similar trends where there was a lot of interest in unconscious bias trainings, and I've never been really a fan of those types of trainings. I feel like they're very surface level and it's important that we are nuanced in our conversations and where I see a lot of DEI programs lacking is that there isn't nuance. It's like, again, racism, very binary conversations about racism, but we're not talking about colorism, right? And how within a racial or ethnic group, there is like these hierarchies that get built up. We don't talk about things like caste caste bias, where if you're from a certain part of India, you have certain uh, power, or you're more likely to have power in that hierarchical system. And so we're not talking about, we're, we're kind of lumping everyone into the same um, category. And so I think that the way that I'm seeing shifts happening in the workplace since I started doing this work is a lot more companies are realizing that it, these sort of check the box exercises and activities like unconscious bias workshops that were being done more in 2020 are not really moving the needle or didn't really impact change and how important things like prioritizing marginalized voices is and also like what is accountability look like I'm seeing more conversations on accountability and I think that's really important because no matter how great a equity system is in the workplace, if there's no accountability for leaders and how people are treating others, the system is not going to be effective. So I'm hearing more of those conversations, but I think also what's unfortunate is because of the economic status that we're in as, you know, in the U.S. and globally, many countries are going through, you know, economic issues. A lot of corporations are cutting back. And I think the first programs that often end up getting cut are DEI programs and people in chief diversity officer roles. And so I do think that that will be harmful in the long term because a company can't be sustainable if they're not prioritizing how they treat people and making sure they treat employees well. You also you also talk to being a change agent. What is a change agent and how can that positively impact? Yeah. Yeah. I see myself as a, a change agent because as an external person, uh, you know, an external consultant, I think I have a lot of power to speak up about things that when you're working inside a system, it's very difficult to bring up. As somebody who worked in academia for a number of years, trying to change the system that I was part of felt like it was impossible. It's not impossible, but it felt like it was for me because I felt like I, I couldn't speak up about certain things because I'm trying to change the same people that sign my checks and that, you know, so it's like, mm -hmm. it's very difficult, but as an outsider, I feel like I can provide a voice to issues that employees have likely been saying and providing feedback on, but I don't have to fear, you know, losing my job because essentially I feel like I have a lot of flexibility and freedom and power to say what I need to say to clients, right? Even if it's a tough pill for them to swallow, 
I feel like they're much more receptive. And so when I think about what it means to be a change agent, I think it's important to ask ourselves, what tools are we already equipped with that we can use to impact change? And for some people, they might be very influential, right? They might be a charismatic person. So it's like, how can you as a person that a lot of people listen to, how can you impact change? For me, I I love to write and writing is one of my primary vehicles that I try to impact change, where I write about things that I'm passionate about and hope that it will make people see things from a different perspective. So when I think about being a change agent, I think about like using the tools you already have to impact systems and structures that are, you know, that are oppressive and that are harmful to different communities of people. And so what does this ultimately accomplish for the individual, for the individual? So, um, Again, people of, of of multiple ethnicities in the workplace, they see, they hear um, things that are derogatory or things that, you know, they see not just a glass ceiling for females, but do, do they have that sense today that no, I can't be CEO if I want to? No, I, I can't get that job. Yes, I do need to act differently to keep my job. Like what is... What is that day-to-day -day feeling that you are trying to, to break as a, as a change agent? I think it's really, it goes back to leaders because I think we spend a lot of time, you know, I remember hearing a lot of conversations on imposter syndrome, which is essentially like when you're the only of something, right? If you're the only mm -hmm. woman or you're the only um, person of color in an environment, uh, how the environment and maybe the people in the environment make you feel like you're inadequate or you don't belong. And what I think is problematic about the imposter syndrome is we train employees not to feel it or to overcome it, but we don't train leaders on how to make sure you're not making people feel othered. And so I, what, what I think is really important is we're focusing on like, who are the people that are creating and making decisions in this environment? And how are we ensuring that they're committed to cultivating environments where people feel safe? And I think we often put the onus on the individual where like, you know, there's often conversations about women need to negotiate more, negotiate your salary. That's how you get higher salaries. Well, research indicates women negotiate as much as men, but women are penalized more when we do negotiate and we're less likely to get whatever the salary is that we are trying to negotiate, right? And so instead of putting the onus on the marginalized individual, I think we need to have more conversations on who holds the power and how do we make sure that there's like a checks and balances system and how are we holding those in power accountable for the environments that they're creating? So I'm starting to see more of those conversations, but I still think a lot of it is like, how do we empower marginalized employees? And it's like, that's great. But also there has to be no amount of mentorship or sponsorship can overcome toxic leadership and managers that just are not emotionally intelligent. So I think it's important that we're spending an equal amount of time focusing on leaders and, and making sure leaders are creating an environment and know how to have those conversations where it may be difficult to have those conversations, but like, how do you pour into employees and how do you, you know, instill them with value so that they're able to grow within the organization? And, and you, you, you used a phrase that I, I, boy, I think it's powerful. Um, not making people feel like other, but like they're others. To me, that almost resonated more than anything I might've heard. Um, I understand it more than, frankly, decentering whiteness or um, equality or negotiate harder or whatever. It just seems to be whoever that other is, they shouldn't be. And, and as a CEO, boy, I just had that moment of, okay, I, I get this. So is is there something in the approach between not others and others? Is, is there something in that discussion? That, that might break through more easily? 
Yeah. So I'm really, uh, I think it's really important to be intentional with language. So I actually think that it is important for uh, folks to understand that we all feel othered. We all have marginalized identities. Some of our identities are more visible. Some mm -hmm. of our identities are invisible, but I think it's important to emphasize that, right? But what I think is the, has been the problem is that we haven't spent much time focusing on how whiteness is centered, especially after the murder of George Floyd. We've talked a lot about inclusion, right? And uh, prior to George Floyd, a lot of the work that I was seeing was on things like gender inclusion and neurodiversity, but I didn't see a heavy focus on interracial and intraracial issues and more specifically things like anti-Blackness. How does that manifest? How is whiteness centered? How do white people center uh, whiteness? How do Black people center whiteness? How do non-Black people of color sent. So I don't, I didn't see those conversations. And so what I actually think is like the specificity wasn't there and still isn't where a lot of companies feel. And I, you know, I understand as an individual who identifies as white, when you hear decenter whiteness, it might be confusing to you. It might sting, or it might be like, wait, what? But it's important for people to understand whiteness is not, you don't need white people for whiteness to be, you know, to perpetuate. Mm -hmm non-black non-white people can still perpetuate whiteness as far as systems and so i think it's important for people to think about it in that way but i also think this conversation is important because regardless of what racial or ethnic group you identify as we all have marginalized identities and no one wants to feel othered so it's in everyone's interest to understand how to create environments where People just don't feel othered, right? And I love, I'm sure you know this poem that Martin, it's Martin something, um, the first they came uh, poem where it talks about first they came for the Jews and I did not say anything. And then they came for this group. Then they came for that group. Then mm. they came for me and there was no one left to speak up for me. And I truly believe that all of our oppressions and issues are interconnected. So if we are pulling up the most marginalized groups, it impacts all of us. Like, I think a really great way to think about it that I've heard is actually the curb cut effect, which originated in the disabled community. And essentially like a curb mm -hmm. cut is when you're walking on a sidewalk, it's the part of the sidewalk that allows you to go into the street more easily. And it was created for people in wheelchairs so that it was an easy transition from the sidewalk into the street. But what's interesting is that it was designed for disabled individuals, but it helps people with strollers. It helps bikers. It helps skateboarders. It helps a bunch of different people. And those, some of whom are not from that marginalized community. So I think it's important, like when we create systems that benefit the most marginalized everyone ends up benefiting for me i'm a big closed caption person because i often sit in bed like scrolling through videos and closed captioning helps me so i can watch the videos i'm not hard of hearing i'm not, not deaf but it, it's created for that community but it helps me right and so i think that when we think about it from that way and understand that like creating programs that help different marginalized communities will end up helping all of us in the long run. It's a better way for people to think about it and frame it. So we're spending time with Dr. Janice Gassimasari. Janice, it's, it's, it's been, it's gone by really quickly. It's it been a very occasional conversation. Um, I, I do want to ask you one last thing. And, and, and I, I know that this is, um, a tough last question because it's not a 30 seconder but um artificial intelligence i mean and, and you speak to artificial intelligence and anti-blackness and i think it's just it's it's we're drawing from images of an image bank that is um very traditionally skewed if you will what what what, <laughs> what do we need to do to improve it there's a lot i think we need more councils and more people talking about uh, AI, I think because there's not a lot of regulation, it's like the wild, wild west. So anyone can create anything. We saw with Lenza where everyone was feeding the Lenza platform their headshots and it would generate different types of AI shots 
we saw that some people's artwork was actually being fed into different AI art generators and being copied and that. So, you know, you have copyright and trademark issues now with that. So I think that there needs to be more regulations, but that would require lawmakers to understand AI. And I think the issue is that the people at the forefront who understand these these things and the ways that AI can be harmful are not in positions to actually make the law. And by the time the law catches up, it's like, it's five years later. So I think we need to be having more conversations on the ways that AI is flawed and then trying to come together with different experts in the field to create ways to sort of address it. I think feeding the data more, uh, having a more inclusive data set rather is, is one solution where a lot of the you know software engineers just have a certain data set and the data set itself is very skewed. Well, how do we make sure that the data set is more representative of different populations or of the American population or of the British population or you know wherever it is that you live, how do you make sure that it's more inclusive? So I think that it starts with having more of these conversations to understand how it, AI is biased in the first place and then trying to address some of those root causes. Dennis, thank you for that. And thank you for joining us and sharing thoughts from your new book, Decentering Whiteness in the Workplace. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Ken. It's been great. Take care.